everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, my apologies for having been a bit of a part timer here over recent uh, recent weeks, but uh, um, quite a lot goes on in my church on a Saturday morning, so it's not always uh, as easy as it might be. But I'm delighted to be uh, with you today. If you'd like to turn to uh, the book of Ruth and chapter one. I'm going to read the first seven verses, but I'm going to start by reading the last verse of Judges 21. So Ruth chapter one, but starting at Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, I went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion, Ephrathathite of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Now they took wives, the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. And both Marlon and Kilian also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Amen. Well, as I'm sure everybody knows, the book of uh, Ruth comes as a sort of cameo between the uh, apostasy and gloom of the book of Judges um, and uh, in the increasingly hopeful story of King David in 1 and 2 Samuel. And... Uh, it's a story of uh, ordinary folk in a rural setting, a bit like the archers, but always accepted as a story of Christ. Uh, and uh, in those days when the judges ruled, the rule of judges should have been ideal when God himself ruled through his own appointed man instead of, instead it turned out to be a time of great declension. And uh, we read in Judges chapter 2 and verse 7, all the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great things of, of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. But then, verse 11, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the, the Baal, took the Lord God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. Now, the rule of the judges should have been uh, ideal, but judgments we see were, were followed by revivals and the drift was constantly downwards. And it ends with the seemingly hopeless uh, uh, end chapters of the book of Judges, 17 to 21, where the very sins of Sodom and Gomorrah are being repeated in Israel. And the book of Ruth is the first inkling of light at the end of the tunnel. So we read that there was a famine in the land. Why is there a famine in Israel, in the land of milk and honey? Because the judges were not ruling for the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, uh, verse 1, it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments. You, I, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the, uh, the voice of the Lord your God. And that's what should have been going on in Israel. But instead, we have uh, verse 15 and 16 of the same chapter. It shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of your Lord, your God, to observe carefully all his commands and the statutes which I command you these days. All these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Curse you be in the city and curse you be in the country, curse you be your basket, your kneading bowl, etc. So there is a famine in the land. Now, physical judgments in the Old Testament often equate to spiritual judgments to us. 
uh, we have no famine here. Um, there's plenty to eat as long as we can afford it. And uh, yet this land has turned away from the Lord. And notwithstanding the events of uh, a weekend or so ago, um, there is no king. Yeah, everyone does what is right in his own eyes. Each man is his own Pharaoh saying, who's the Lord? That I should obey his voice. And uh, therefore we find that we have uh, a situation of apostasy and the judgment of God coming upon us. And the well-known verses of Romans uh, chapter one, the wrath of God is revealed against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Uh, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, so that we are without excuse. For although they knew God, they didn't glorify him, nor were thankful, became futile in their thinking. And again in verse uh, uh, 21, uh, they, they, they professing to be wise, they became fools, and therefore God gave them over to uncleanness and the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And so there's a different, um, there's a different type of famine in the land. Uh, like in Amos chapter 8, there's not a famine of food, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Again, not a famine of possessing the word of the Lord. The Bible's readily available, but there is a famine of hearing it. People do not hear it because it's not preached, or they do not hear it because they can't be bothered to come to church. So we read on. Um, the certain man of Bethlehem, Elimelech, and his name means God is king, and he should exemplify the ideal rule of the judges. But instead, he did what was right in his own eyes. His wife, Naomi, the name means amiable or pleasant. Marlon, however, means sickness, and Killian means consumption. Were they sickly children? Isaiah 64, verse 11, all our pleasant things are laid waste. And then let left Bethlehem because of a famine. He left the house of bread to go to the far country, far indeed uh, from the Lord. Uh, the number of uh, uh, sections in, in the book of Deuteronomy commanding us to, uh, have, or commanding the Israelites to have nothing to do with, uh, with, with the country of Moab. But why was there food in Moab when there was none in Israel? Because Moab's judgment awaits him without remedy on the last day where Israel is chastened by the Lord to lead him to repentance. And we ourselves may perhaps are being uh, chastened by the Lord in these days because of the sins of the nation. And uh, Hebrews 12 said, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, but do not be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son that he receives. But Elimelech would not endure the Lord's chastening. He, he would not say, uh, perhaps with the, uh, the, 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 the prophet, prophet Hosea, Turn to it. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he is torn, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. What Israel should have done, what Britain needs to do, what maybe your church and my church need to do, to repent and return wholly to the Lord. Now, our churches might may not be the most exciting, the most erudite preachers, the best music, but the church of God is the house of bread because the word of God is preached. But instead, so many people are saying that they don't like this preacher or that preacher, or the sermons are too long or too short or too complicated, uh, or uh, this or that. And instead of praying for God to open our hearts to receive what he has for us. And don't be like the, the Israelites and despise the bread that God provides for us week by week. Take what he gives by gratitude. Don't leave it lying on the ground as the Israelites left the manna lying on the ground. Uh, there is a need of repentance. There is a need of turning uh, to uh, the God whom this country has turned away from. And, uh, in Joel, uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 12, now therefore turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. 
Uh, so our our, uh, our repentance needs to be genuine. It needs to be uh, it needs to be inward, not merely outward. But not so Limelech. Like Cain, he went out from the presence of the Lord, taking his family with him, and he proved himself not to be one of the Lord's people. First uh, John two and verse nineteen, so they went out for us uh, because they were not of us. And the reason they went out, it was shown they were not of us. The famine was not so bad as to force others to leave. Others sat under the Lord's chastening, but Elimelech was gone. Uh, and uh, so were his sons. He was through with Israel. And he married them into Moabite women. And uh, again, we're told not to have anything to do with the, the nations around. And uh, he showed himself to be an enemy of God. James 4, verse 4, friendship with the world is enmity against God. Now, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death. And so it was with Elimelech. He died, and within 10 years, so did his sons. And the wife, his wife, Naomi, was left abandoned in a strange land with only two equally destitute foreign women for company. And uh, we read in Isaiah uh, chapter 1, uh, the, the daughter of Zion is left like a hut in a field of melons and so forth. Imagine the high hopes that they set out for Moab with husbands and children. What was left now? Only to cry out uh, with the psalmist, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, Psalm 42, all your waves and billows have gone over me. Yet God had loved Naomi from the foundation of the world. Why had he treated her this way, stripping her of everything that was dear in life? Because without it, she would never have come to him. She would have been taken up with a new life in Moab, learning the language, the customs, religion, and her knowledge of the Lord, the God of Israel, would have been first rejected and then forgotten. Life during these 10 years did to Naomi what nothing else could have done. It stripped her of her every worldly crutch and brought her to the end of her own resources that she might find in Yahweh her only resource and reach out to him in her affliction. And maybe some of us wonder sometimes, why have God, has God treated me so harshly? Why has he dealt with me in this way or that way? Proverbs 3 and verse 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't leave on your own understanding. On the last day we'll find that all his ways with us are righteous. All of them are for our good. All things work for God, for those who work for good, for those who love God. Maybe the only way that Naomi could be brought back was to be stripped of everything that might keep her from God. Nothing left but a faith that said, like Job, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And then she heard that God had returned to Israel and visited his people, giving them bread, verse 6. So she returned, drawn by invisible, yet irresistible hand of God. I have loved you, says the Lord, with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And she returned broken and contrite, no expectations. But with great hope, although she didn't realize it yet. So what can we learn from Naomi? That often chastisement is for our own good. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. If we are being chastened as a church, if we're being chastened individually, then it's for us to heed the rebuke, turn our steps. As Naomi turned her back towards the Lord. And we, as we could see if we read through the rest of the book, God turned Naomi's tears to joy. And he promises to do the same to us if we will follow her example. And say perhaps again with the psalmist, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. And again, we can say with Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's, let's, come, let's come to prayer.